This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live with Lucien, uh, Lucien Pugliarisi of EPRINC. EPRINC is an energy policy research think tank organization in Washington, D.C., except the fact is that every time I talk to Lucien, he's at another conference in some far throes of the, of the universe. I never know where he's going to be, but I have, I've just surmised that this time, Lucien, you're actually in Washington. What do you think? Well, I am in Washington, and it's uh, raining cats and dogs outside. <laughs> okay. It well, looks like a rainforest. If it's of any help, I just want to let you know that in, the, in, in Honolulu, the weather is absolutely perfectly beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that's true. <laughs> Anyway, so uh, every, every couple of weeks, uh, Lou and me, we get together, we talk about energy. We call this show uh, Energy in America. Uh, I've been doing it for a while, and it's really interesting to see his viewpoint and see the, sort of the national conversation on this. Um, and uh, we've covered a lot of things over the past year, and I really appreciate his coming around to uh, discuss what, what EPRINC is thinking and doing these days, uh, either in Washington or anywhere else. Um, and this time we're going to talk about uh, a subject that is really in the news a lot these days, and that's the CAFE standards, because uh, the president has decided to, uh, what, the, the, I guess the uh, Barack Obama was trying to lift them to something like 50, 60 miles a gallon, and the present 30 miles a gallon, um, oh, yeah. and, uh, and the Trump administration says, no, we're not so sure about that, and put that increase on ice. And then some number of states led by California have indicated they don't care what the president says. They are going to maintain an increase in the CAFE standards anyway. So here we are yeah. with, a, with a national debate. Yeah. Right. So I think that we've talked about CAFE, the corporate average fuel economy standards in the past. And now there's a lot of more new information out. And I, I thought we would go through that and help the listeners uh, see the difference between the kind of political fight and what are the real issues on this on this sort of very important public policy uh, concern. So what I want to do today is first sort of take take uh, the, the the listeners through some just basic information, set up the problem, and then at the second part of the the program we'll, we'll talk about what the data actually show us and maybe give us an insight on how we ought to really proceed. So if we, so if, let, let's put the first figure up, which shows the sales of ZEVs, which means zero emission vehicle. Now, zero emission vehicle, think of a Tesla. It's basically a battery electric vehicle, also called a BEV, a BEV, right? Mm -hmm. And there's also something in this table called PHEVs, which are plug-in uh, hybrid electric vehicles. This is like your uh, hybrid, uh, you, you know, a lot of cars which have... Uh, uh, Toyota both, is a leader uh, in that, yeah. Toyota has one. And then we have FCBs, which are fuel cell vehicles. So I just want to give everyone a source of the magnitude. So if you look at the total sales of ICDs, which is internal combustion vehicles, right? Mm-hmm. In the, in the U.S., that's moved, and that's the right-hand side of the column, that's moved from about, uh, in 2011, from, say, uh, oh, I don't know, 12, 12, million, uh, 12 million vehicles a year, up to 16 now in 2017. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole internal combustion cars and light trucks. In 2017, we're about 16 million units. And the, all the alternative vehicles, the ZEVs, which are the uh, green, the plug-in electric vehicles, which are the blue, and the fuel cells, which are almost non-existent. They really don't get above, in 2017, they're about 200,000 units. So it's still a very small part, right? And, Interesting uh, how the BEVs yeah. and the PHEVs are, have become, oh, since 2013, about equal in the marketplace. Um, and the uh, FCVs, like those are hydrogen, I guess. Um, yeah, they they absolutely. are really really minimal. Yeah, exactly. We don't have a lot of fueling capacity for them. They're very exotic, and there aren't that many that are available. Yeah. So I just want to give the audience a sense of what we're talking about. We're talking about a small set of folks. Okay. Now, if we go to Figure Two. This is data from the U.S. Department of Energy, 
and it shows kind of what will be the what will the fleet look like under existing policies, right? Under existing policies of conventional cars and light trucks, and in that would be some plug-in, you know, some hybrids and stuff, and zero emission vehicles. Mm -hmm. And it's very important here to also see that there's a lot of discussion about how the electric cars are going to take over. But if you look at the official data from the U.S. government, you understand that, you know, the U.S. fleet doesn't get that much bigger. It gets a little bit bigger. It gets from like 220 to 250 million cars. Mm -hmm. But the portion of that that is zero emission vehicles remains quite small. And as it's going to become apparent as we talk, the real issue is how fast the fleet of conventional cars and light trucks turns over. That turns out to be much more important for air quality and carbon than the rate at which you introduce new exotic zero emission vehicles. Because the old cars uh, have greater emissions, yeah. Exactly, and new internal combustion engines are very, very clean mm -hmm. and getting better. Mm -hmm. You recall we had that story about the 1968 Mustang, which generated about one ton of pollutants, you know, not. I do remember that, yeah, yeah. And now the new one, over 100,000 miles, the new one's 10 pounds. Okay, so yeah, yeah. That, that, I want you to know, because this is a big, there are two big issues in CAFE that rarely get discussed by policymakers. One is what we call the rebound effect. Is if, you, if you get a, a car that's more efficient, you drive it more. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, the, other, the other one is what we call kind of attribution substitution. If you buy an electric car, you find families that buy electric cars. They also buy a big SUV. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not... How interesting. You know, really, that one is yeah, really you, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, it's so a compensation thing, maybe a balance. You know. Exactly, attribution substitution, we call it. Okay, so I think that these figure, these should, these are real phenomena that take place in the marketplace, but policymakers like to stick their head in the sand and pretend it doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. But it's a relevant issue that should be discussed because, as I say, the fight is over. Well, these, you know, these dinosaurs that want to get rid of cafe. And uh, the environmentalists will wear white hats and really know what they're doing. Okay, so it's really never that simple. <laughs> <laughs> so now, what, what do you think motivated the administration to knock off the, uh, the, uh, the, the plan to go to, what was it, 50 miles a gallon? Or was it 50 or more? I think there's, yeah, I mean, it's actually, there, there's a difference between what the kind of institutional number is and what the on-road number is. And I don't want to, if we don't want to get into that debate now, but almost when we had the crisis, the financial crisis in 2008, and GM almost went broke, or they went into bankruptcy, right? the auto signed up for everything. But all of the heavy lifting in terms of CAFE was backloaded, right? It starts now. And it's oh. a very steep, costly curve. Very expensive, so, yeah. You know, so they, they just, you know, they had a very high discount rate. So, well, we'll deal with that in 2018. Well, 2018 is here, and I think the, auto, the autos have been very careful. They've been saying, we want to preserve a national standard. We want you to negotiate with California, but we don't want to kind of give up on fuel efficiency. We want to continue to make progress. Right? You know, let me ask but, you this question, and I really yeah, hadn't yeah, thought about yeah. this before. Maybe you know the answer. So, okay, to get to a higher standard costs more money. Um, yes. What 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 does an automobile manufacturer put that money into? What kind of technology is so expensive? Do we have the technology, or do we have to invent the technology? Is well, it a no, special you, you alloy? Can, what is it? Yeah, you can get the technology across the entire frame: tires, brakes, the way you build the air conditioning, the uh, material. And by the way, we didn't get into I. We didn't get into safety, which is a n whole nother program. But the evidence suggests that if you, if you and, and what's going on, I'm going to give you a couple of other things. If you buy a smaller, more fuel efficient car, you also face a higher risk of death. Mm -hmm. You need to understand that. Because it's lighter it's, and it, it doesn't have as much protection. And, yeah. yeah. And because the way CAFE works, right? 
because the cafe is not, it's fleet wide, but it's based on the footprint of the models you make. That it's becoming one way the auto manufacturers will adjust to the cafe standard, even the existing cafe standard, is to make less low margin sedans and more SUVs. Mm -hmm. Because in, for example, the state of California, whenever you sell a, an internal combustion vehicle into California, you face a compliance cost, a compliance penalty, which has to do with the ZEV requirement. And if you don't make enough ZEVs and sell enough of them in California, you have to buy the credits from, well, Tesla. Mm -hmm. That leads us to our next figure. Uh -huh. okay. So okay. the next figure sh shows you how much the federal government, I'm not talking about the state of Hawaii or California, which also provide direct consumer subsidies, but how much the federal tax credits for ZEV right, uh, were between 2011 and 2017. And you can see that on those six years, seven years, the federal government has spent $4.6 billion, right? So you have to ask yourself, that's a lot of money, even in Hawaii. And uh, this shows you the distribution in figure three by uh, manufacturer. And... Uh, under the law, they lose these credits when they hit 200,000 units of total production. So, and right now they're lobbying to continue this uh, subsidy. So, mm -hmm. uh, one one of the ways to kind of meet the more stringent standards is to continue the subsidies for the ZEV program. And actually, if you extended those ZEV credits out to 2048, you could probably rebuild the U.S. naval fleet three times over. <laughs> It would be a hundred billion dollars. <laughs> oh boy! Yeah. So uh, that's interesting. So this this is to support the industry, or I guess it's also yes, to it's incentivize to, to, efficient vehicles. Yes, it's to incentivize electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. Even the internal combustion engine is efficient, but not as efficient, not as uh, low emission. You no, know, not as efficient. Yeah. It's not as low emission, but it's close. But all these things occur at the margin. That's very important. Mm -hmm. And then I guess before we break, Jay, let's look at figure four quickly. And one of the features that I think, I, I put this one here. This shows the Nissan LEAF range as a function of outside temperature. And I, I just thought this would be a useful uh, uh, graph to show our uh, friends in Hawaii because you know that the range is a function of outside temperature. And as you get to 70 and 80, even 90 degrees, uh, the range of your automobile declines rather dramatically. This is actually not just for the Nissan Leaf. It's also true for the Tesla and all of them. So the battery is not as efficient, to, whatever it is, the, the drive is not as efficient if it's warmer outside. Is, is there a way to... Oh, yeah. uh, is anybody considered using um, air conditioning or some device to reduce the temperature so that the uh, you know the car will be more efficient? Um, you know they, where they've sort of used you're using the air conditioner yourself, <laughs> which is adding to the. <laughs> I don't yeah, right. think they got. Yeah, so I mean it's a, it's a basic thermodynamics problem. You can't really fix it. Yeah. Okay. All you right. might be able to get a bitter or, or a bigger battery at some point, but you can't really fix that. Okay. You can fix it with materials and stuff over time, but it's very marginal. Okay. okay. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. So, so what I want to do next then is, and you let me know whether we should break now or keep going. Well, let's take a break now, Lou. That's uh, Lou okay. Pugliarisi. Okay. He's right. the CEO yeah. of Eprink. We're doing energy in America. Today we're talking about the CAFE standards. That means corporate average fuel economy. And there's a national debate going on because the administration would like to uh, leave them as they are rather than increase them as the uh, Obama administration wanted to do. We'll be right back mm -hmm. after this short break to find out more from Lou. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. 
Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of the Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. Okay, we're back. We're live. Lou was telling me his solution to all of this during the break. And you're, you're going to have to wait a couple of minutes to hear it. <laughs> so, yeah. Lou, you wanted to track through some other slides. Why don't you do that Yeah, now? So, so I think one of the issues is if you have a kind of carbon theory of value. In other words, if your policy is just to worry about carbon and nothing else, you can get yourself kind of wrapped around the axle. And uh, one of the things I want to show you is some recent work by John Lesser at the Manhattan Institute. Actually, this report is available to all your listeners quite easily. But let's, let, let's look at figure five. Here, five yeah. Okay. So, as you know, this is not really a problem in the Hawaiian Islands, but particulates, you see this very dark smog in China and, you know, well, over we the We have LA eruptions basis, so. now, so we ought to be all the more concerned about uh, particulates right, in but, the air, yeah. Well, I don't think the volcano is subject to EPA, so that's a problem. <laughs> and the, uh, the, and, and the particulate that we were about are the ones that are called 2.5, 2.5 microns, right? Okay. Those that have health effects. So the first, if, if we look at figure five, this says, okay, in, if we go out to 2048 and we take the Energy Information Agency data and we say, okay, for every... Uh, new internal combustion vehicle that's produced, we're going to substitute a zero emission vehicle. Right? We're just going to, in the model, substitute it and see what happens to uh, the uh, en environmental consequences. And we're going to do it across the whole system, you know, refineries and power plants. So if you look at this chart here, figure five, it shows particulate matter uh, using 200... 2014 average emission rates. And the, up the, the vertical scale here are the uh, tons of, uh, of uh, particulate matter emitted into the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. and, the, uh, and, what, and what that happens over time. So if you see the red line, that shows you under this, under this model in which instead of producing internal combustion vehicles, we keep substituting uh, ZEBs across the whole period to, 20, to 2050. And you can see that the particulate matter from uh, zero emission vehicles is much higher by 2048. And, you know, the calculus across the thing is quite remarkable. And then if you look at the blue line, that's particulate matter um, if we didn't substitute, but we continue to produce internal combustion vehicles, including particulates generated by refineries. And you might ask, well, why is this happening? And the reason this is happening is because even through 2048, a substantial portion of our power is generated by both coal and natural gas. Uh, coal, natural gas doesn't produce that much in particulates, but coal does. So if you don't use a full system analysis, if you don't look at the full fuel cycle, you're going to get fooled by this. So, so let me let me see if I can understand. Yeah. So, you yeah. have, if you if you are have all these electric cars, and they're being uh, supplied with electricity from coal burning plants, then well, you have just from whatever the average fuel mix is in the U.S. under the EIA forecast, which is pretty good. You know, mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, yeah. But if we had renewables supplying those cars, as is the hope yeah. in Hawaii. Then, then there would be no emissions on either side of it the was, equation, right? Okay, let's give it straight. No one cares. The world climate does not care what Hawaii does. It has no <laughs> effect. It's irrelevant, actually, 
a totally crazy discussion. <laughs> you are too small. Okay? We're talking about the whole U.S. here. Okay. Who cares what happens in Hawaii? Okay, that is irrelevant. That's just you know. We're you just a bunch of environmentalists oil. over here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can run it on coconut oil. I don't care. You're just gonna spend money that people don't have. Okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so looking so, at national uh, or even international, uh, what you're saying is that if, even if you have electric cars and you're generating power uh, from fuels that uh, leave particulates in the air, you have a lot of particulates going forward. And even under aggressive renewable program, which we have, by 2050, you're still going to have coal in the mix. I think we talked about this last time. You know, we still, you're not going to, you're not going to, uh, substantially, you're not going to increase the coal production or the coal combustion, and its percentages are going to decline, but it's still going to be there. Okay. Now, let's look at figure, uh, oh, it says figure, that was a mistake, the next figure five, okay, <laughs> which is comparison of carbon dioxide emissions in ZEV and internal combustion vehicles, okay. okay. And this one here does show, if as we go out to 2048, for every time I produce an internal combustion vehicle, instead I substituted that for a zero emission vehicle, I can in fact reduce CO2, right? So if you look at this chart, you can see the green line, right? That the green line shows CO2 emissions go from, uh, you know, you, you, zero is just the base here. So you have an increment of 100 million tons, right, mm -hmm. in 2050. And uh, if you include uh, refineries with existing EPA standards, right, so if you use a, a kind of a more higher standard instead of the 2021 standard, to, but, a, you know, more rigorous standard, it's not quite as much, right? And if you go to the red line, you can see that, you could probably say that a, a ZEV only strategy would reduce um, carbon dioxide emissions by about 100 million tons okay, by 2050. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to the last table, which is called Figure 6, right? Which shows that U.S. greenhouse gas emissions by economic sector, right? 1990 to 2016. And what I want you to understand about the charts you saw in the previous figure is that even if we did a full-scale ZEV program, replacing every internal combustion vehicle with a zero-emission vehicle, we would not reduce our carbon footprint by more than one-half of one percent. So the bottom line of this story is this is a very expensive program with a very low yield. Mm -hmm. And you can go ahead and characterize Trump's program as some kind of Neanderthal crazy idea. But in fact, the data supports a more robust debate on this issue. And that debate should suggest that at the margin, if we think we want to control first, Anything we do should look at the full band of environmental consequences. Sulfur, uh, particulate, nitrogen oxides. We should look at lithium and cobalt, mining tails and all that. So we should have a more robust discussion on the total life cycle environmental consequences. Yeah, I, I certainly the, agree that you have, to, you have to consider both the source of the electrical power uh, and the right. car and, and you have to net that out to see what you're really yeah, getting. Yeah. But and, isn't and the I obvious think, answer to make the source of the power renewable between now and 2050? Be, but, yeah, but that's, we know that that's not possible. Right? <laughs> it might be possible in Hawaii, but as I said, who cares? <laughs> it's not possible for the U.S. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. Yes, if, uh, you know, if pigs could fly, yeah, that would be fine, but that's not what's going to happen. It's we know. Yeah. We, we know from the EIA data that even under the best case scenario, and we know from the work out at Stanford stuff, that we're not going to get there. We're not going to get to a fully renewable system in the U.S. by 2050. And by the way, 
that is absolutely the case for the rest of the world. Yes, I would, I would so, assume. But so the, so big, the I, big question is to go back to the break now and, and find out. This is the big cliffhanger question, Lou. We need to go back to what you were saying in the break and find out from you your idea for an alternative solution. I actually can hardly wait for this discussion. Can you so tell the us? Alter the alternative solution is to stop throwing your money away and put it into programs that actually yield something useful, which is probably get on the gradient to reduce uh, emissions from the power sector, right? That's the big, you know, and, and to, you know, we can continue to do research and make progress on zero emission vehicles. We ought to definitely do that. But we should quit taking money from the middle class and giving it to the upper class so they can drive Tesla. Okay. <laughs> that is a really bad policy. So it, in it, my view, you're just talking about instead of putting all this money into reducing emissions from the, you know, the, the, the cars that people drive around the country, why don't we put some money into reducing emissions and particularly particulates from the power, the power generating units in the country? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and I don't think particulates aren't the problem. It's carbon, right? Mm -hmm. We can see here that we have fairly strict standards on particulates and on sulfur. But, you know, if you generate more power, and you're going to need to generate a lot more power to run the ZEVs, and even with this, you know, this dream about, well, we'll only, we'll only charge them at night when people are sleeping, and uh, we have uh, battery power, or, you know, the wind is blowing, you know, any realistic assessment suggests that it's a global problem, that the problem ought to focus on the highest return of carbon emission reductions, and that's probably not a ZEV program or a stringent CAFE program for the U.S. Those funds would be better spent somewhere else, probably in the power sector in China or Indonesia or uh, you know, uh, other places in the Pacific. One last question for you, actually, yeah. is, uh, you know, yeah. there are other things coming down the pipe between now and 2048, 2050. For example, automated cars and these uh, cars where you, you rent a slice of time in the car, uh, ride share, okay? and they're multimodal things. Now, I, I can't say that they're happening all over the country, but I imagine they're happening at least in some cities in the country. They're happening here, or at least there's a lot of talk about it. And so transportation is going to change. You know, for Hawaii, that is a big piece of fossil fuel right now. And I wonder if it's the same you know, elsewhere, and whether these numbers, expectations, forecasts built in, are building in the notion of changing models of transportation. So I do think that uh, autonomous vehicle is, whether you use an internal combustion vehicle or an electric car, autonomous vehicles do offer enormous uh, tectonic shifts in a way. But it's unclear yet whether they mean people will use the vehicles more or less. The conventional wisdom is people will use their cars less. But a highly efficient autonomous vehicle system might actually take people out of mass transit and into vehicles, which are going to be low cost and cheap. So once again, I think you always have to be careful that any kind of you know, this is like thinking fast, thinking slow. You have a conventional wisdom about something. You say, let's do that. But sometimes you have to slow down and look at the problem and say, uh, well, maybe it's not really what we thought. Maybe we have to have an intelligent way to, uh, you know, a systematic way to deal with this problem. Well, is this and conversation taking place now? I mean, California has, has led uh, 10 or more states in order to uh, you know do the high standards anyway, I don't know if there are other states coming on board. I, I don't know if this is going to be in the courts. How is this conversation going to be taking place? Well, it would go into the courts, but basically this has become a political issue between California and Trump, in my view. And what's going to happen in the midterm elections is, um, and you know, one of the things that's happening in order to meet this standard, we don't have time to talk about this now, but the auto companies are going to produce less sedans. It just doesn't make sense for them to produce sedans. They're lower margin, and they have a high compliance requirement, right? 
So they're going to produce more SUVs, which have a higher margin and a bigger footprint, which gives them a little bit of a break. Yeah. And I think this is going to be fought out politically. And so in the midterm elections in 2018, I expect to hear, I expect to see Trump tweeting, Nancy, in all the districts, all the swing districts where people have lots of pickups, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer want to tell you what kind of car to drive, <laughs> and they're going to... And they're going to make it much more expensive. <laughs> Vote yeah, for me. I bet you're absolutely right. I think we can, we can absolutely <laughs> expect those tweets. Well, thank you, Lou. It's a great discussion, important issue. Okay. I always enjoy these discussions with you. Okay, great. Okay, Energy in America, right, Lou Pugliarisi of Eat, Bring in Washington. Thank you so much, Lou. All right, Jay. Take care. Bye-bye.